to take confusion away. Yeah, that's the enemy. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That's fabulous. I'd switch places with him in a heartbeat. Wouldn't that be great? What town is he in, or do you know? Well, the thing is, uh, anytime you travel, God has people in every city. Every city. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. Yep. Any prayer requests <laughs> there, Popo? All right. Anybody else? Okay. Oh. Huh, anybody else? Tiffany Stum. <laughs> Anything cool happened to anybody this week they want to share? He's always ahead of us. Oh, the little stuff. Hmm. Anybody else? Lord, we love you and praise you and thankful to be here. Thankful for this weather. Thank you for the Blackberry Frost, Lord. Thank you for the love that you show us and caring for us and every little detail and every little thing that you do. I thank you, Father, that uh, you are faithful and that your mercies are fresh every morning. And I thank you, Father, for all that you bless us with, all the things that you protect us from, all the gifts that you give us, oh God. I thank you for your presence, that you're always with us. You never leave us nor forsake us. You never leave us hanging. You don't go halfway with something and then stop, Father. You, you finish the job and you did that this past Friday historically you said it is finished and you conquered death hell and the grave and then on this Sunday this Easter many many years ago Lord you rose from the grave and you conquered it Lord and you showed us what our future is going to be is a sure resurrection father for all those who have received you Lord as their Lord and Savior. I just thank you for that. I thank you that you chose me. I thank you, Lord, that you chose us as a body of believers. I thank you, Father, for all the blessings and things that you have done and that you'll continue to do, that you carry us, Lord, until our old age, until our gray hairs, Lord. And we thank you for that, Father. We thank you for the day and for the celebration of the day, for time with friends and family for time with um, our church family, oh God. And I pray that uh, we can exhort and encourage one another in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're still in Luke 24. We were um, in that last Sunday, so 
Today we're going to take a trip to Emmaus, and uh, if you'll go with me to um, the text is going to be uh, 13 through uh, 31, so we'll start there. And as we um, kind of backtrack and lead up to that, last week um, was the first day of the, the week, and the girls had gone to prepare, or to finish preparing Jesus' body. And uh, when they got there, um, they were pleasantly surprised that the stone was rolled back and that he wasn't there. <laughs> so they're uh, a little concerned and trying to figure things out. So there's uh, angels there that um, one of the gospels says one, the other one says two. So there were angels there and asked, why do you seek the living among the dead? And then... The angel said, remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. And they remembered his words, realizing that he had said that uh, the Son of Man would be delivered into sinful hands and crucified, buried, and uh, rise again uh, the third day. So uh, here it is, the third day. And uh, these two guys are uh, heading back to Emmaus. And I'm sure your lesson told you Emmaus is about seven miles And uh, which is not bad, you know, for a a walk, a couple hours. And uh, back in that day, you know, they were all slim, trim, and lean. (laughs) They uh, they weren't eating McDonald's and um, Hardee's. So uh, they were able to make this walk. But while they were walking, we we see that uh, Jesus himself drew near. What a day that was, huh? So let's start with this and read the scripture. And think about this day that these two guys had, <clears throat> Cleopas and his friend, or Cleopas, wherever you want to put that accent. And um, they're walking back and they're, they're having a conversation about what had happened. And we'll start in verse 13. Now behold, two of them, talking about, you know, the disciples. Now this was not the apostles, not, you know, one of the twelve Now there's 11, we understand that Judas had already uh, done the deed and hung himself as a result, that um, this was not the 11 um, innermost apostles, this was some of the um, uh, disciples who of course had followed him. We have no idea how many people followed him, you think about how many people actually followed him along the way as he traveled. And two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near (laughs) and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And uh, so as they were walking and discussing what the women had said, Peter and John had read into the tomb, and they were, you know, talking about, well, what they said, what the women said, and trying to piece it all together uh, and figure it out and reason it among themselves. And uh, you think about when you're traveling on a road back in that day, you know, when we're driving our cars and our trucks and we're passing people on the road, if you would break that down and take everybody out of their cars and trucks, the people you would be passing on the road if you were walking or riding your donkey or pulling up on trigger or whatever, you know, you're riding. (laughs) Um, We had a big old buckskin named Big Dan. (laughs) So as we were walking along or whatever, people would probably come along beside you and walk with you. And then some might walk faster than others because you know how some people pass you? I mean, just think about, you know, as far as how we travel, we're just in a vehicle, they were just hoofing it, right? So, you know, it wouldn't be unusual for people to join you as you were walking and travel along with you. It would be pretty neat, huh? And think about it, too, how they would have to protect themselves from highway robbers and bandits, how people probably banded together to walk together for what? Protection and safety. So, um... Here they are walking along and, and Jesus joins them. Well, you know, they don't think anything about it, but they, you've got to see what the scripture says. Their eyes were restrained. So here they are and they're, you know, um, talking about everything and sharing 
their uh, experience with uh, talking about, you know, well, you know, I got to eat with him one time and we had this conversation, you know, just talking about Jesus. You know how it is after people pass away? We sit around in the funeral home and we talk about what our relationship was to that person. They're doing the same thing. This is what, you know, just normal life, just like we do. And so um, as they're walking along, <clears throat> the scripture says it's about three score furlongs, which is, you know, probably seven miles because a furlong is 600 feet. They actually called them stadia back in that day, S-T-A-D-I-A, -A, stadia. We get our word stadium from that. And uh, they're talking along about the things that were happening. And uh, that's pretty cool because, you know, when we're all together in a, a couple of people and we talk about Jesus, do you realize Jesus shows up? Honestly? He does show up in the midst of two or three. When two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there in the midst of them. That's pretty cool. <laughs> So we shouldn't be surprised that Jesus showed up and uh, stirring up each other's memories of him and everything. And so as it came to pass, Jesus himself drew near and um, they were reasoning and, and trying to figure this out. But we also know that uh, there's another part of the gospel that talked about... Uh, I've got these pulled up... Um, after that, he appeared at Mark, Mark 16, Mark 16, 12. This particular story is repeated by the uh, gospel writer Mark. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. In another form is what Mark says. So, interesting. So, uh, he drew near and their eyes were restrained. They didn't know who he was. And uh, they continue their conversation. And uh, that just means that Jesus temporarily did what? He didn't let them know who he was. He can, he can do that, right? He can keep you from knowing who he is. Their eyes were restrained. And now he's going to gradually reveal himself. And we've had those experiences, haven't we? You're in the midst of a hard time. You're in the midst of a just overwhelming situation. And you know the Lord's there, but he hadn't revealed himself yet. And you're wondering, where are you and when are you going to show up? He's there. His presence is there, but he can withhold himself from us. He can temporarily restrain. Their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And you could take that and do a whole nother message off of that. That's, you know, fun to even think about. He's there, but you don't sense him. A bush? Yeah. He sure is. Since you said that, you know, what other forms has he taken on? He came in the form of a burning bush and spoke to Moses. You got another one? Like, no. That was uh, just the angel of the Lord that used the donkey to speak to him. But, hey, you know. Um, what are you talking about now? There's, oh, oh. Oh, oh, the pillar of, of the cloud. Okay, there's another one. Good, good, good. The cloud by day and the fire by night. Good, good. There's his presence. Um, his Shekinah glory in the temple when he would be around the uh, Ark of the Covenant. What's, go ahead, Tammy. What's another one? The star. The star of David. So the different things that he'll make his presence known through that. That's good, that's good. You think about all the ways that he shows up to us in uh, the form of a stranger that may help you, like when you're in another uh, country. I had that happen on several occasions where I would get lost and there would be a stranger and I would think, thank you, Lord, I know that was you. Because <laughs> you have people in every country, in every city. So many different ways that he shows up. Um, he uh, showed up, um, his spirit showed up in a dove, right?
came in the form of a dove whenever Jesus was baptized. He came in a voice. You got another one? Mm-hmm. Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. The dove just landed. Hmm. Came in a four, the fourth man. Sure did. He, he can show up in whatever form he wants to is the point that we're making here. Oh, that would be so cool to see a rock go. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, thank you. So he, he, he does. He shows up in all these different forms. He can show up in any way that he, but their eyes were restrained so they did not know him. So we'll get to whenever they finally realize who he is. And he said unto them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk? And look at the last words. And are sad. Why are you so sad? So he was walking with them. His very person, the resurrected Jesus. Why are you so sad? Again, there's another message in that. Why can we be so sad? But it's real. Their pain was real. Pain is real. And you've got to feel it. You've got to go through it. It is a good process to mourn, to grieve too hurt to be in that situation but he's going to he's going to show up here in a few minutes and let them see him when they sit down to eat right but for now why are you so sad and he wants them to voice their pain it's good for us psychologically to voice our pain it really is to let her out and to let her flow now, all you men know that women have to repeat theirs. we got to say ours more than once. Mr. Frank's shaking his head, Miss Sam. <laughs> i got to say mine a bunch. And, and, I, and, and even though he's not listening, he's just sitting there in that rocker, and I'm just saying it, and I'm like, are you listening to me? <laughs> As we flip the TV, right? Miss Carrie. They needed to go through their emotions. They needed to, to let it all. And, and it's, it's important. And the Lord gives us these emotions because we're flesh. And um, exactly, while they were walking, yep, As a, in a conversation, absolutely. So uh, don't pay a therapist all that money. Just uh, find you somebody that you trust to unload on. <laughs> Go ahead. You don't. You don't think about them coming back and then walking along beside you? Exactly. A lot of times I think we're tough on these biblical characters. Like, and you didn't know it was Jesus? No. Because you're not thinking somebody's going to raise from the dead. And then when it dawns on them, wow, they head back to Jerusalem, don't they? Anyway, we're going to the end. Let me stay in the middle here. What kind of conversation is this that you've had with one another as you walk and you're sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas or Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have you not known the things which happened in these last days? So, of course, he's going to ask him that question. Like, you know, the news about Jesus' crucifixion had spread. I mean, you know, people are telling people and it's spreading throughout the region. And all those Jewish pilgrims who had come for the Passover, as they were traveling back home that day, they were probably telling people along the road when they would stop and y'all, along the road, you know that uh, the entrepreneurs were still alive and kicking in that day. They had the roadside little uh, places to stop and to, you know, rest and get a little, uh, 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 maybe a bed and, uh, and a nice warm meal of some sort. So uh, the news is going to be spread because it was not a small event. It was not a small event. People were talking about that. And 
Jesus was very popular. Everybody knew he, he was the rock star of that area. Everybody was talking about it. So when they talked about that he died and he was crucified, then people were like, what? We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he had come to, to, sit, to set this world free. And so the, the discussion there and the sadness of the, the non-reality. Now think about it, y'all. What are your expectations? Don't we have expectations? We have expectations of things we expect to happen. And it did not happen with him as they expected it to. And uh, so they were hurt. And they were disappointed. And their, their um, fulfillments of this man changed drastically. But little did they know <laughs> that something cool was about to happen. Isn't that just like the Lord? So uh, no wonder Cle Cleopas was questioning this stranger. How could he not know what was happening in Jerusalem? Because they're on the way back from Jerusalem, so they're figuring he's coming back from Jerusalem. So he should know because the whole city was buzzing about it. They, they didn't know that the one they were speaking to, of course, was uh, him. And so um, they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Because he said, what things? The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So they were telling him he's a prophet who was mighty in deed and mighty in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today's the third day since these things have happened. So we were hoping the things that we hoped for, for Jesus to accomplish... Hadn't accomplished for them at that point in time. And we're like that too. The things we're waiting for Jesus to accomplish, they haven't necessarily accomplished. They haven't happened yet. But what's your expectation? Is it still there? Is that hope still there of what you're expecting him to accomplish? Now Jesus, you know, had a high regard uh, in the minds and the eyes of all of these folks, the villagers, those who lived in the city, with the exception of one group, one particular group, y'all know who that was, those Pharisees. Those Pharisees, they wanted to get rid of him, they were jealous of him. He committed blasphemy, said he was God, how dare he. So they were rejoicing till Sunday morning and the body was gone. What? What'd they do then? I bet they were scrambling, you know they were paying off soldiers. They were telling, uh, just, you know, his disciples stole the body, all of that. So the idea of a crucified Messiah was a major stumbling block to the men who were walking. To the Pharisees, they were just trying to cover their tracks. But to these guys who were walking, he's a Messiah. i got to say this, y'all. When he came the first time, he came to redeem mankind, right? What about that second time? Hadn't happened yet. What's he coming back as? He's coming back. Say it again. He's coming back as the Messiah. That first coming was the Redeemer. That second coming. See, they didn't get the second coming. Y'all, we hadn't gotten the second coming yet either. That second coming is going to be Messiah. And he's going to step out, and, and it's, it's going to be amazing. I'm not talking about the rapture. I'm talking about when he returns to the earth to judge the earth. That's going to be, the, the, that's going to be who they were looking for at that period of time. He sure is. Faithful and true on that leg too, buddy. So he's, I'm, getting, I'm going to get you. He's coming again in that form he just didn't come in the form they expected. Again, what's your expectations of the Lord? Does he not fit your expectations of what you expect him to do in, on a daily basis? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Go ahead, Mr. Lee. General Lamb. 
a lamb. That's another form. <laughs> Absolutely. That's another form, the line of Judah. We can make that list longer. Good. So all these people were disappointed because he didn't come to do what they expected him to do. That happens in my life all the time. He doesn't do what I expect him to do, how I expect him to do it, and on my calendar. <laughs> right? On my calendar. So there's God's calendar and there's my calendar. And guess who's Trump's who's? Oh, yeah. And not in the way I expect him to come. He came as a lamb. You're exactly right. He came as a baby. Came as a, and if, if y'all are watching any, you know, kind of television throughout, you know, this whole week, they've been showing The Chosen. They've been showing The Bible, that old um, series that has been around since the 70s, great series called The Bible. The, the Chosen is amazing in that series, if you watch that. And um, it, he just he, he came to redeem. He came to die for the sin of mankind. But the next time, that second coming, not, not counting the rapture, that rapture, I, hey, could happen today, would be great. I'm looking for it every day. Every day. Come on, Lord. Come on and redeem us. But uh, these two men had believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but after what happened to him in Jerusalem, they were sad. It didn't happen the way that they thought it would. And the message in that is amazing too. Things don't happen in the way that we think that, that they should happen. And kind of cash it in and give up. You know how Job said, I hate my life. That's what Job said. I hate my life. I wish I had been a stillborn baby. That's what Job said. I hate my life. But look what God did for Job. Job never saw that coming. Look what God has done in our lives. We've got to remember. We've got to remember. So Jesus, unlike them, was walking along with them. And he was saying all that, that, here's Cleopas and this guy saying, Indeed, besides all this, today's the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. His body's not there? Well, where is he? We don't know where this guy is. So we're just going back home. I mean, think about what they were telling Jesus. We're just going back home. You know, I got to get up and go to work tomorrow. I actually do have to get up and go to work tomorrow. This past week was great. <laughs> Enjoyed the break. But it astonished us. And when they did not find his body, look what they're telling Jesus. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. I would love to see the look on Jesus' face. Could you imagine the smirk on his face? Kind of. He is alive, dude, right here. <laughs> and how he was probably busting to say something. But his timing is always perfect. And, and, and they saw angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us, means they were all together, they were with the disciples, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Him they did not see. So we're, all these things that are being said and, and all the information that uh, Jesus is getting. And besides all that, y'all know what crucifixion was reserved for back in that day? The boys, while they were watching the different programs, uh, the Bible or, or the Chosen, uh, I haven't let them see the Passion of the Christ yet. I, I'm kind of holding off on that one till they're a little bit older because that, that one's, that's heavy. So um, they, I, they did watch the one, the scene of Jesus' crucifixion in, in, with the, the, the series called The Bible last night because it's, it's more, it, it's not as... It's over, you know, because the, the passion's overwhelming. And, um, but they are going to see it. I'm going to show it to them. I'm just um, kind of holding off. So I think about the, and I was trying to explain to them whenever um, Mary and Joseph were coming back from Egypt, and they, as they were coming back into um, the area, there were people who were crucified along the way. And, they, and Solomon said they crucified other people? Because he, you know, who would know? 
And I said, yeah, they crucified them. They were criminals. This is what the Romans did. That's, that was their form of capital punishment, right? That's how you, you, you killed people back then for, and punished them for their criminal doings. And so uh, to think about um, what Cleopas and his friend, as they were going along, and that Jesus received this, this Roman crucifixion, here's the thing. Now, Unbelievable. Even when the, the French did the um, guillotine, that one was more merciful. So it, a tough capital punishment. Tough. Oh, I can't even think of it. Yeah. And the suffering. So th that's the point. Crucifixion was, re was reserved for criminals. So it was truly hard for people to believe that God, listen to this, that God would allow his chosen one to suffer in such a manner. Why would God allow his chosen son, his only begotten son, to endure such sufferings? Don't you ask God the same thing? Why are you letting me go through this? I thought you loved me. I thought you, that, that I'm your child. And that causes a lot of unbelief. They're sitting in all this unbelief right now. If he's the Messiah, why did he die like this? Go ahead. Absolutely. Something to accomplish. He said it is finished on Friday, didn't he? Three o'clock. It is finished. But these, these disciples, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We trusted that it would have been he which would have redeemed Israel. Now think about that when you say it in your own you know, uh, thoughts and, and your mind. I trusted you, Lord, thinking that you were going to Help me avoid this, or is this what you do to the people you love? But again, if he, chosen by God, God himself, was steadfast and on that duty, that job that he came to do, if he could do that for me and for you so steadfastly, can I not fulfill the suffering that he has chosen for me Steadfastly as well. Can I stick to it as well? Can I, can I go through it as well? As steadfastly as he did. Exactly. To comfort them with the comfort you've received. We can eventually. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I can minister. Right. That's one of the many reasons, absolutely. And that one brings us comfort <laughs> to know that we can minister. Well, I, let's go ahead and get to, you know, what Jesus said. Then he said to them, and this seems um, a rebuke, doesn't it? Oh, foolish ones. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ who has suffered these things Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And so when he says you're slow of heart, it meant they were slow to comprehend, they were slow to understand and then act on what they understood. It was a spiritual dullness. 
And he was charging these two disciples with having the same spiritual dullness that he even used that same word with, with the Sadducees who didn't know the scriptures or the power of God. And so this is going to cause these disciples to not believe all that the prophets have spoken or prophesied. If they'd paid more attention, right, to the prophets or maybe listened in their Bible class (laughs) in the Old Testament, they would have been sure of his rising from the dead that morning the third day after his death, as they were as sure of the rising of the sun. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In essence, Jesus was saying, was it not declared that the promised Messiah would first suffer and then reign and that he must go by his cross to get to his crown? Did you catch that last one? To go by your cross to get to your crown. You don't get there easily. You don't get a crown easily. you got to suffer to get the crown. That he must first go by his cross. Have you never read uh, Isaiah chapter 53? Is what he's, you know, he's just, all these things. So what he does is he takes them from the um, beginning. He takes them from uh, Moses. And he starts with Moses. He probably started with Genesis 3.15, didn't he? Where the the serpent would be crushed under the heel of the woman. He probably started there and went all the way through the prophets. And you think about everything that he would have said, that his undertaking of our salvation was voluntary. He chose to go that way. Like Tammy said, he had a job. He had a, a duty to fulfill. And he chose to go that way. He chose... He knew it was necessary that he would suffer and die. And he said when he had suffered these things, he would enter into his glory, and he did that that morning at the resurrection. And it was his first step upward. And upward. He, it, it's called his glory because he was entitled to it and to enter into his glory. That's at the end of verse 26. And it was the same glory that he had before the world began, because that's what 1 John tells us, that it was the glory that he had before the world even began. And so he ought to enter into his glory, as well, of course, as in the sufferings, because the scripture had to be fulfilled. And so this, the embarrassment, the humiliation of the cross, he bore it for us. He entered and took on our sin, the propitiation of our sin. I don't know about y'all, but I think my sin probably was enough. But think about the entire world, past, present, and future. That entire bundle of sin. And so that he tells us he's going to enter into his glory. And later he's going to wear a crown of glory. Hebrews 2 tells us that. He's going to enter into his glory. He's going to wear a crown of glory. And like JB, you just said, he's going to come on that white horse, faithful and true, written on his thigh. And he will bring judgment. He will be that lion. He will be that Messiah. And so as he talked to them about everything, could you imagine listening to Jesus do an expository of all of those scriptures? Could you imagine hearing him, the word, logos, giving that scripture, giving that word? as he explained everything concerning himself by showing the different scriptures and how they were fulfilled and explaining everything that concerned him as he continued from Genesis 3.15 with the suffering servant in Isaiah, the pierced one in Zechariah, the messenger of the covenant in Malachi. He was reintroducing these two guys to the Old Testament. Could you imagine that would have been very cool? And so they were listening, but still, let's go on. He still, verse 28, then they drew near to the village of Emmaus. I bet that walk went by just like that. I wonder at what point Jesus connected to them. Was it at the beginning? Was it in the middle? Was it one-third of the way? You know, I'm thinking, how, how long did he need? I can promise you it was at the exact right moment because his moments are perfect. So they drew near to the village. Go ahead. Huh? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why it'll be a lion, right? <laughs> ah. They drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. Now, I need to keep going, boys, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, because it's toward the evening, and the day is far spent. You need to just go ahead and stay with us. It's getting late into the evening. And Jesus accepted their invitation. It's going to include eating and maybe staying overnight. And so Christ, he wants to give a few more instructions and comforts to these men. And that makes me think of Revelation 3.20. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him. Open the door. And I'll come into him and sup with him and he with me. And it came to pass as he sat at the table with them. He's going to reveal himself right here. When he sat at the table and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. When he broke that bread, their eyes were opened. What do you think was in what, what do you think about that? Tell me your thoughts. He broke that bread and their eyes were opened. Now it's it, no t- they're telling how many countless times they actually... Now, these guys weren't at the Last Supper. That was his innermost guys. That was his twelve. But how many times did, he, did these guys probably sit down and eat with him? And when he broke the bread, and that brokenness, and that suffering, all flowed out of who he was. How do you think they probably knew it was him? Did they see his hands? Did they see the nail scars, the prints on his hands when he broke the bread? I don't know. But they knew who he was once he broke that bread. And he gave it to them. He took the bread and he blessed it. And he did the same like he would do in other meals with other disciples. And like he does with us. When do you recognize him? When he's breaking that bread with you. When you're reading his word. Breaking bread with him. You can break bread with him at any time reading this Bible. You can break bread with him right here. It becomes real. His suffering. Your suffering that you go through connects to his suffering that he went through. He's gone through everything you've ever gone through. He's gone through every heartache and every sorrow that you can imagine. How? On the cross. On the cross, when he took your sin and my sin and the sin of the world, he experienced every sin that could ever be experienced. He experienced the the murderer. He experienced the pedophile. He experienced the adulterer. He experienced the child abuser. He experienced the homosexual. He's experienced everything that we could ever imagine when he took on the sin of all of mankind. I can't imagine that. When people tell me their sorrows and tell me their their troubles and and, and you take that on and you, you carry that burden and share that burden with your brother or your sister and you hurt for them, that is such a minute thing to what Jesus did on the cross and what he experienced. And furthermore... God has never left us nor forsaken us. He's never left me. Never left me. I might not have sensed he was there. And I might not have felt his presence in my flesh. But he's never left me. He's never left me. But Jesus, at that point, y'all, God left him. God had to. Why? He couldn't look upon him in his holiness. He's experienced more and knows exactly every heart and every intention of every heart. See, we don't know the intention of the heart. We don't know what's going on inside a man or a woman's heart. But he does. Absolutely. You break that bread with him right here. Absolutely. 
And he broke that bread and he blessed it and he gave it to them and their eyes were opened. And this intimacy of this fellowship. And then look what happened after that happened. And he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they knew him. And then what happened, y'all? He vanished from their sight. He was gone, wasn't he? Pray for your mama. Absolutely. (laughs) Jesus vanished from their sight. You know why? He had a resurrection body. He could do that. I cannot wait for the day that I can do that. Because we're going to have that body too. Y'all know that. You can vanish and just, there you go. Flash will have nothing on you. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? And then they realized, no wonder we were feeling like that. They were walking with God. That was Holy Spirit right there. That was Jesus. That was God. Did our hearts not burn? And they realized they both had the same experience because they they were listening to Jesus while he was talking. They weren't about to interrupt him. They wanted to hear every word he said. And they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed. They were saying, The Lord is risen. He appeared to Simon. And then they were trying to say, Hey, but, but... these are the things, this is verse 20, uh, 35, these are the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And then while they were standing there, as they were saying these things, and, and this is uh, not part of the lesson, but we're going to do it, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace to you. He showed right up, right there. That had to be an amazing day. <laughs> and then he goes on and says, Why are you troubled? What had he just asked these other two disciples? Why are y'all sad? Why are you troubled? Am I not enough? Am I not here? And if you don't believe me, look what he did. Uh, Doubts arise in your heart. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you have seen I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe for joy, because they were just trying to pick up their jaws, their bottom jaws were on the floor, they were trying to pick those up. (laughs) He said, well, do you have any food here? And they gave him a broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it. I'd say that that was a body, if it could eat. Right? Why are you sad? Why are you troubled? By the way, it's okay to be sad and to be troubled, but we know who we serve, and we know what he's done, and today is a celebration of it. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for the Easter uh, Sunday. I I just pray, Lord, that uh, people would pile in here. This should be the Super Bowl of Sundays, Lord. I pray a lot of people come today, and I pray that uh, that they would be encouraged, that they would um, come and rededicate themselves to you. They would worship you and celebrate you and your resurrection and all that you've done. I pray for the message that it would be powerful. I pray for the songs, Lord, that they would speak to our hearts and they would help to cleanse us as we sing praise and worship to you, Lord. Cleanse us with your righteous blood, Lord. We love you so much. We love you so much for what you did for us. Thank you for taking my sin, Lord. Thank you for experiencing everything. and for sharing and carrying my burdens, Lord. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, go conquer the world.